Hi, I'm Allie, and this is The Service Design Show, episode 197. Hey there, brave change agent. Welcome back again to The Service Design Show, the show where we invite the brightest minds in our field and uncover what's truly needed to design great services that resonate with people, push businesses forward, and honor our planet. I'm your host, Mark Fontaine. Our guest today, Ali Drought, has a seemingly magic superpower. A superpower that transforms the way you work and look at our world. What's that superpower? Ali can look into the future, or should I say futures? And you know what? In this episode, you'll learn how to obtain the superpower as well. Looking at Ali's career, her track record is nothing short of amazing. Amongst many things, she was the strategic foresight lead at Capital One, the group strategy director at AKQA, and now she's the head of innovation at design strategy at Nike. The red thread that connects all her past roles is that Ali has always been thinking about our future beyond the first and even the second horizon to uncover insights that can help us make smarter decisions today. Now, hold on, I hear you thinking, how can we think about the distant future when we can't even predict what's going to happen tomorrow? Well, without giving too much away, part of the secret is to imagine and explore not one future, but multiple futures. How? That's also the question I had for Ali. So in today's conversation, you're going to learn about the art of connecting seemingly random dots, how to continuously feed yourself with new things that might seem irrelevant at first, but are key to understanding the bigger picture and about a tool that helps you make the abstract future something that's tangible and which you can have a conversation around. Ali shares a lot of great insights in our conversation today, but if there's one thing you should not miss, it's the part where she explains why humans can't be the most important stakeholder in the design process and other better ways we can go about this. I'll be honest, I never dug very deep into strategic foresight as a discipline, but this conversation with Ali has definitely opened my eyes to its importance and potential and how it can help us service design professionals to have more impact. So without any further ado, I invite you to join me for the conversation with Ali Drought and I'll catch you at the end for my closing reflections. Let the show begin. Welcome to the show, Ali. Hi, Mark. Nice to be here. Nice to have you on. Um, I'm very much looking forward to what we're going to chat about. Um, but the first thing we always do here on the show is to ask for a short introduction. Uh, I've read about you on LinkedIn and I've read in uh, the prep email what you've been up to. <laughs> That's a lot. But could you give us like a 30 second uh, intro into what you do these days, maybe? Sure. These days I am working at Nike as um, head of strategy for innovation and design. Um, it's really fun. I love being at Nike. It's back in Portland, where I'm from, which is a nice kind of circular moment in my life. Um, and previous to that, I've been working in service design in design strategy in foresight um, and helping to build teams and practices across a number of other companies or agencies over the last 15 years. So yeah. I think you have some uh, interesting connections with a uh, few of the prior guests on the show. I do. I do. That's how we got together in the first place, <laughs> which is nice. That's a snowball effect. Um, <laughs> you mentioned that you have some prior uh, service design experience. Uh, the other question that we always ask at the start is, do you recall the moment that you sort of first heard about service design? Do you have a, a service design epiphany light bulb moment? I don't know if I can call it an epiphany moment, but I do remember the first time that I was introduced to the term service design. This was about 
2011, I was working at Ziba Design in, in Portland, Oregon. And um, one of my coworkers came in, new hire, and said, hey, I'm going to be starting service design. And I was like, I don't understand what that means. What? Are, how do you design services? What does this look like? And this was, you know, a, a while ago as we were still defining what the whole you know, practice meant. Um, and it piqued my curiosity. Mm. And about, I guess, six years later or so, I was working at Capital One and um, – you know, adaptive path came into the Capital One family, classic, you know, service design agency. And I had the pleasure of working with a bunch of those employees from Capital One and and adaptive path and learn service design from arguably some of the best in the business. Um, although I'm open to being proved wrong on that. <laughs> well, no, I, I, I'm not going to argue on that one. Uh, interesting that you were at Ziba. Yeah. And one of the agencies, consultancies that Definitely was on my radar when uh, we started the studio here back in 2007. Um, cool. Ali, um, we always have a lightning question round, five questions or rather sentences for you to finish to get to know you as a person next to the professional. You haven't prepared for this, so it's the <laughs> first thing that comes to your mind. Are you ready? Yeah. All right. If you could have uh, a dinner, with a one historic figure, who would it be? Rosa Parks. Noted. All right. Second uh, question. The thing that always puts a smile on my face is? Running in the mud on a trail in the middle of the woods and coming Obviously. out totally covered. <laughs> yeah. All right. Uh, next one. If I had unlimited resources, I would? If I had unlimited resources, I would try to figure out how we can save this planet a little bit better. <laughs> so I think there's some amazing, that is longer answer. So tell me to be quiet whenever, but there's amazing startups happening around planting trees, a trillion trees to help terraform essentially our planet. Um, it's the only one we get. So I think that's what I would invest in. Mm, all right. Number four is my greatest fear is death. These are hard questions, Mark. I know. Yeah, I know. <laughs> My greatest fear is that I don't have impact, I think, in this world. And the fifth and final one, you're almost at the finishing line. Our world needs more. Our world needs more love, I think. <laughs> yeah. And on that <laughs> note, we're going to try to transition into a conversation about design. <laughs> Uh, more love uh, from design uh, for our world. Um, in our prep chat, you mentioned that you feel um, we need to move beyond, and I'm going to cheat and look at my notes, uh, beyond anthropo <coughs> anthropocentric, yes, anthropocentric design. Mm -hmm. Please elaborate. What is that and what do you mean? You know, I, similar to service design, I was introduced to this term anthropomorphic and anthropocentric um, through my master's degree, uh, one of my professors there. And it really means designing around a human first and human only <laughs> mentality. Um, it's interesting because we're in a world where we've actually changed geologic eras <laughs> into anthropomorphic, anthropocentric. So it means it's all around humans and the impact that we have. Um, I think it's really interesting because a lot of the ways that we teach design, design thinking, service design is around human centeredness. And my prompt is we need to get beyond human centeredness towards thinking around what's the impact towards nature? What's the impact towards technology? What are the other uh, key stakeholders that we can design around to actually make more interesting, more sustainable, um, and a bit different solutions to help us progress towards the future. Cool. Let's explore this topic uh, much deeper. One thing that um, I know a few people say is, you know, this whole thing about moving beyond human centeredness, it's actually a bit weird because um, being human centered means that we're actually doing stuff that preserves our planet. Like you can not be human-centered if you're designing 
in a way that's harmful to the planet. So um, I'm curious to your distinction to this, like, do we need to move beyond human centeredness if the things that we are designing inherently, like, can we design something that's not human centered, that's bad for the planet? Does that make sense? Can we design something that's not human centered, that's bad for the planet? Um, yeah, probably. Although I think a lot of the things that are bad for the planet right now start with human desire. <laughs> you know, I think it's an interesting dichotomy. And that's that's the question here. Like, was that was that truly human centered? Mm -hmm. Because if we're actually designing for human longevity, then we would be designing for the planet. I think that's the argument you're making, and I don't disagree with that at all. I think it's like the turn the way of designing only for humans and without thinking about longevity without thinking about anything other than like need in the moment or you know satiation <laughs> of something immediately um is where we get ourselves in trouble because we're not thinking about timeliness or timelessness how we can exist as a species longer and in so doing preserve the planet that we're inhabiting right um so i don't think it's don't design for humans anymore. I think it's designed for humans, but realize that it's not just the immediacy of human need that we're designing for. Now, uh, yes, and thank you for establishing that baseline. <laughs> you um, you work for a huge for-profit companies, commercial entities. How did you arrive at this point that you feel, hey, we need to we need to address this. We need to talk more about this. We need to get better at this as a practice. Can you take us on a journey? How did you get here? Sure. I um, Well, first I have to say, <laughs> this is just my opinions on the podcast today. Please don't hold anyone else accountable. Just just Allie. Um, but, you know, I've led a number of teams over my career in business teams, creative teams, strategy teams. Um and I have to say that each team has a different perspective on how to get work done, how to design, how to create new opportunities, how to progress business. Um, and I think all of those are tools in a tool belt. So service design is a, is a tool that I have in my tool belt. Foresight and strategic foresight similarly is a tool in my tool belt. Design thinking, you know, you can go on. Um, but as I mentioned, you know, I was getting in my master's in design strategy and strategic foresight at California College of the Arts, which is a, an amazing school, I have to say, um, blending kind of business and, and creativity. And one of my professors brought up anthropomorphic design. And so it made me question, okay, so what is, if we're going to be designing for an anthropomorphic moment, um, you know, what's not anthropomorphic <laughs> and what in our world has been designed that is not solely focused on humans? And that got me to this understanding or this questioning around what is technology? What do we create? How do we think about technology? Um, and you have to think about a broadening of technology. So tech is not just silicone, right? It's the way that mycelium under, underscore the entire forest and they actually like foster communication networks between trees. That's amazing. That's an incredible technology, uh, but we don't necessarily call it technology. So in thinking through that, I started questioning what is true anthropomorphic design, what is not, and how do we start imagining a different mode of engagement if we're designing services across technologies for humans or nature or technology. So um, that was a bit of a tangent on why anthropomorphic, but how I got here in, in this kind of large organization um, you know, I bounce back and forth between agencies and, and corporate, and I learn something different every time I do that. So starting with Zebo, when we talked about earlier, I started thinking about and, and working on product design and service design um, as an account director. Actually, so I was on the business side of this creative agency. We started thinking about and working on projects called Lighthouse Projects. And Lighthouse Projects looked... 15 years out in the future, we started looking at what potential futures could look like, but we did it through a design thinking lens. And I loved thinking that far out. I thought it was so interesting. Um, and I wanted to add a little bit of process to that. You know, I thought maybe there's a different way of approaching the future than, than design thinking. 
and that led me um, to California College of Arts where I got a master's in, in strategic foresight and added some process and some rigor <laughs> to that thinking about potential futures. And that's one thing I learned was it's not just one future. There's never just one future. <laughs> There are many possibilities of a future that you can start designing for. And it's about looking at the scenarios and planning for what you want to happen, what you might want to avoid. So using that, I went into Capital One, um, started working in design strategy there, met up with the lovely people from Adaptive Path after that acquisition, worked on service design and helped um, kind of scale that, that studio and then transition into making a, a strategic foresight studio within Capital One and saying, okay, if we can use these tenants of service design and, and foresight and design thinking, what can that do to change the products or the services um, that we deliver to humans, right? So money is a very human thing. It's the most, it's really the, the network by which we live our lives right now. And, and so I couldn't think about a better way to apply service design integration of humans and data um, and that kind of thinking at, at a system level and being in Silicon Valley in San Francisco at the time, it was naturally tech forward. Um, that's when I started learning about this really interesting work that someone was doing with GMOs, transitioning in the DNA of tobacco plants into data storage devices. So you could actually embed DNA into a, t a tobacco plant plant the seed, grow a plant, harvest a seed from the grown plant, and extract the same data sequence from the DNA. So you're talking about a database that is inherently natural. Fascinating. Totally illegal to be in the U.S. because of GMO laws. Um, but you can imagine like a forest, a real forest that is data. You know, it's like you have a library forest kind of thing. Really interesting work and totally changed the way I was thinking about how we design, what we design for. Um, and how we can actually make a difference in the work that we do. I can keep going. <laughs> well, <laughs> it's hard for <laughs> for me to even formulate a question around this. Um, maybe uh, one thing that's on our mind is how do we, <clears throat> do you have some examples or some things that can help us to try to bring this into our day to day? So you're in the strategic foresight mindset all the time. You, you've seen the light. It comes very natural to you. How do we as beginners try to adopt this into our practice? I think it's more a, a mindset. Um, there's a mindset and a practice to anything, right? You can have a mindset of, of service orientation, or you can have a practice of service design. You can have a mindset of thinking about the future, or you can have a strategic foresight practice. And you can have them hand in hand, or you can have them independently, right? So that's something I always think about. Um, same thing with just, you can do it at any application you can use that for. For strategic foresight, what I think is interesting at first is to just test yourself by getting out into the future a little bit. <laughs> and this is where I'll really put on my like, nerd glasses i i am a huge sci-fi fan i have a large library upstairs <laughs> with lots of sci-fi and fantasy books i talk about this all the time but um i really love reading science fiction because it gets you out of the known day-to-day -day world it challenges the paradigms that you are operating within helps you think a little bit differently tends to help you think a little bit differently about the future also um so i would say you don't have to read sci-fi, but <laughs> it <laughs> read, <helps>. <laughs> read. <laughs> I think it helps. There's some great articles about why leaders should be reading sci-fi because it helps you scenario plan a little bit better. Um, and so I'm happy to share that link <laughs> as, a, as a show note if that's helpful. Um, what I would say is read widely and read with abandon. Like I, I love this stat about Bucky Fuller, Buckminster Fuller, who fairly famously went into like a magazine wall and would always choose the top left magazine, no matter what that magazine was. And it would just change content and intake. Um, and that's something called associative fluency. You can take all these different inputs and you can start thinking about how they interact with one another. They can be current inputs. They can be, you know, speculative fiction. They can be, you know, fortune magazine, whatever it is, but starting to, to use those patterns and pattern finding to think about what the implications could look like 
is a really nice way to start testing how you think about the world, what services could interact, or how those trends could emerge and change into the future. Um, so that's one thing I would say. Read some weird stuff and see how <laughs> it feels. <laughs> um, yeah, okay. Makes uh, sense. I can see that going, getting, um, or feeding into the um, uh, the generalist mindset, the uh, mm. associative mindset, the the uh, the T-shaped person uh, who knows uh, a lot about, no, a little about a lot, um, just enough. Mm. Uh, but um, okay, reading um, sci-fi and expanding our uh, vocabulary. <laughs> How do we, um, what's what's the next thing uh, if we want to get to the beyond human-centeredness? If we want to get beyond human-centeredness, you know, this is something I'm still working out. It's not something I have answers for. You know. So how far I'm... have you got? Where are you? And what have you tried? <laughs> what have I tried? I, um, I try thought experiment, experiments fairly often with my teams or with myself. Um, I start creating scenarios or, or using prompts to create scenarios about potential different futures that we could design for. Um, one person I was, I was listening to about a month ago at an internal conference at, at Nike um, was really talking about weaving intelligences. And what I thought was so interesting about that was that he was taking this idea of different intelligences, whether they're natural or technology or human, and then weaving them together. And he was talking specifically about AI and human. In weaving them together, you actually get to a different output than you would if you were just using a human you know, writing style or just chat GPT, right? By weaving those together, by making an interaction between the two, you get to a different place. And I think that's a fascinating way to say, okay, what, what, easy tools do we have at our disposal like check gbt or like just walking out into nature and figuring and seeing like what the interaction looks like amongst amongst trees or animals or whatever it is just getting out of our day-to-day -day human interaction can help us change the the perspective that we have on what our impact is on the other intelligences in our world so i know that's a really kind of ephemeral <laughs> um, answer, but I do think there, there are simple, easy ways for us to challenge our paradigms about what we do, how humans interact, and what the impacts are in the world around us. So in preparing for this, I have to admit, I used ChatGPT. I was like, cool, how do we, what might an answer look like? How would that, how would that formulate a different response than I would as a human? Um, and then helped add structure, although I changed it. And as I was telling you this morning, I went for a run, um, got a little muddy, was very wet, <laughs> it's raining here. And you just think differently about how you engage in a cityscape, right? If you're in it in a different way than you are in a car. So I think there's just small prompts in our worlds and in our lives. And whether or not you're a runner, whether or not you use ChatGPT, there are little things we can do throughout our day to start changing the way that we think about how we engage and what other... <laughs> other intelligences are around us. Thank you for, for sharing these examples. And uh, I can immediately see how just noticing noticing more things around us and uh, uh, being less, it might sound weird, but being less focused, uh, mm. or being able to switch between, uh, the, I think somebody called it the, the butterfly and the drill hammer, <laughs> so the, the jackhammer. Um, mm -hmm. That 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 helps. Um, you, I think, mentioned also something about uh, changing Zoom levels. Yeah. How does that work, and what do you do? Yeah, changing level of Zooms, um, and Zoom as in focal height. I guess not necessarily the technology we're on right now, recording together. But I think changing levels of Zoom when you're looking at, um, you know. The classic example is the forest for the trees, right? I actually think you have to start changing levels of Zoom and how you're thinking about uh, design challenges or impacts to the world. So if you're thinking really high level, thinking like, hey, I want to solve regenerative farming, <laughs> right? It's like, that is a really big thing to, think, to start thinking about. Um, you also need to start thinking about, okay, how is that applied on a very cellular level? What does that mean for a, 
a farmer in Central America, for instance, and like, what does that look like on their farm? So I think sometimes we get caught, and I've seen this in the foresight world, I've seen this in corporate worlds, you know, we get caught at one level of Zoom, and we just say, okay, I'm going to solve like this Excel spreadsheet to get like this product into market by like next week or whatever. Um, or you're saying, oh, I need to really figure out what the the sustainability metrics are for 2030 <laughs> for our entire company, right? Those are really different levels of Zoom and they can impact one another. So I think drawing and trying to figure out and, and practice challenging oneself to say, okay, what's the big idea we're going for and how is it applied on a cellular level? It's something that's really hard to do, but it's important as we think through long term. And I talked a lot about like timelessness or timeliness, right? If we're thinking about a longevity of solution, you need to think about the big picture and the small picture simultaneously. So I tend to say it's like rapidly flipping between both the large landscape, like the huge forest that you see, and not forgetting to look at the at the beautiful structures of the leaves on each of those trees. So this is this is what makes that landscape so beautiful. Um, again, a little maybe poetic, but <laughs> I think uh, I know a lot of design professionals who are <clears throat> pretty good and enjoy this uh, Zoom level switching from being very detail oriented to seeing the entire system. At the same time, it can be extremely overwhelming and mm -hmm. like. Um, almost too much because you see you see all the possibilities and all the challenges at the same time. I'm curious, how do you handle that? Because when you do look at the forest, you're like, oh, wow, it's, it's so immense. And then getting back to that cellular level can either feel, am I really making an impact here? Because I'm just working mm -hmm. on this small, tiny piece. Um, no, so just curious, how do you, how do you, how do you balance Yes. That's a great question. Um, I would like to imagine that I handle it elegantly, although I feel like sometimes maybe not so much. I think uh, for me, it's it's with a sense of inherent optimism. Um, I'm a hugely optimistic person. I can see, you know, the a big strategy and say, okay, cool. What could this enable for us? This like huge, you know, large idea. Uh, what will this enable us to do as a company? What will this enable us to do as a as humanity, as like a as a group of people? Um, and that keeps me going. That gets me really excited. That's naturally where I go. My brain goes big picture because I like to think about systems of systems. I like to think about ecosystem design, you know, and what that looks like and what that means. Um, and that's just naturally where my brain goes. Like, let's go big. Like, go big or go home kind of thing. That's where my brain goes. So it's actually more difficult for me to get down into the details. Um, so I have to motivate myself more to say, okay, big picture, what are the specifics in which it, it and how it can come to life? And to do that, I actually think about the impacts it can have on, on individual humans or um, what that can achieve, allow us to do in the short term, kind of breaking it down, makes it more tangible, which um, helps me connect to it as an individual human more or as an individual as a friend or as like a coworker, is like whatever it is it helps me understand and have empathy towards those that have to manage that kind of level of detail which often is not in my role um so i try to make it a bit more human which is funny because we've talked about <laughs> non-anthropocentric design but you have to bring it back to something to ground it so i tend to ground it in a human impact and the optimism that i can bring in to say okay cool this actually helps someone do their job better or this is what they do on a day-to-day -day. here's how i can understand it better um at the same time i think it's like sometimes i imagine as splitting my brain in two halves and saying i have two brains right now or two two visions right so one vision is really one eye is looking at the big picture and one eye is looking at the details and you have to hold them simultaneously, which is why I think it's so difficult because you have to see them at the same time in order to make sense of how the small goes into the big and vice versa. Um, so maybe I call it, you know, mental projecting or um, 
sometimes I call it like a, a mental library where I'm just like, okay, I see the, the shape of the library. I can also see the books. It's an interesting way of projecting visually into a way of organizing data for me. And the books and the library, the forest and the trees. And I think we can make a lot of <laughs> analogies here. Um, I know. Where do you, uh, so um, digging a little bit deeper into this one, you said you're uh, an optimistic person. Do you also you have Do you also have the patience to see these things come into fruition? The, the reason I'm asking this is when you do see the big, big picture or the grand vision. Um, usually, things don't move at the speed that you wish they would move. <laughs> Hardly ever. <laughs> Hardly ever. And especially with, again, when you see uh, the potential for humanity can take generations. So what's what's your coping strategy with the speed at which things do or do not change? This is something I talk about with my wife often. <laughs> she, we're working on my patience. <laughs> but I, uh, I tend, I'm a, I'm a pretty impatient person. I like to see impact. Uh, and that's at odds with some of the, the timelines that I tend to be working on sometimes. So how I cope with that is I say, all right, we're making, let's call it a, a product for 2028 or something like you're starting to work on a product for 2028. Um, we know that the inputs will change along the journey towards 2028. So how I, I continue to remind myself the output is only as good as the inputs that you have right now. So make the best possible plan or strategy or product idea or concept that you can given your inputs right now, given the insights from humans, given the business realities, given you know materials and, and methods to make, given whatever technological you know systems you can use. Those are your current realities, right? So don't question them. Just or you should question them. We can get into that later, but. <laughs> um, Use what you have now because you have that. And then recognize that across years, those inputs might shift and change. You might have new technologies available. You might have different human insights. You might have a new supply chain. Um, that should and will shift the output that you're moving towards. And that's okay. You should not make something now and say, done, dusted. I'm going to go see how it happens in 20 years from now. Um, so continual reevaluation re actually helps my patients <laughs> level because it it helps me continue to process and think about what has shifted, what could shift. Um, but that necessitates a lot of maintenance, <laughs> you know, and tracking, which you can make fun. I promise, it's not, it's not as boring as it sounds. But I think that's how I cope: is that I I have an idea, or I'm working on a project. I use the inputs of today recognizing that inputs of tomorrow may be very different and will impact the output. Can you uh, share us a bit more about how you do the maintenance and how you do the tracking and how you re-evaluate and realign? Actually, it's a really simple model, which I'm sure many people already know. Uh, it's called the STEEP model, social, technological, ecological, economic, and political. Um, and those are just ways to look at data points, insights, you know, moments in time across these five different sectors. And it gives you a pretty good, what I kind of call, um, like cultural brailing kind of thing to be like, what's going on in the world around us in a general sense. So you can see, you can try, if you're looking at something for a scenario around, you know, we'll use regenerative farming again. Okay. What are the things that are happening in vertical farms? What are the things that are happening you know, politically to drive uh, local farming resources, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and you use this model to help organize your inputs and continue to prompt you to look across different sources. Again, this drives an element of associative fluency, like we were talking about earlier with, with reading. And then you can start looking at where new prompts are emerging. So that's something that we'd call like loop signals, newer things that may seem a little weird or avant-garde or out of the ordinary and you start tracking these weaker signals as they get stronger and stronger um and that's where you start seeing new trends um new drivers of change emerge that can impact 
your project or your product or your service that you're designing. That sounds a lot more rigorous than it needs to be. Sometimes it's just saying, hey, what am I you know, noticing and feeling? Does this apply to my project? Does it apply to a product? And this is a continuous practice um, that I do that, you know, again, I learned through some of my master's courses at, at, at CCA. Um, but it's a nice mental framework to then help guide how you're tracking the ridiculous amount of content that goes out into the world right now and help organize it a little bit um, in my own brain. So that's what I use. How often do you do this? Daily? Weekly? Monthly? Yearly? This is a continual practice for me. Um, whenever I read something, I think about it, you know, kind of catalog it in my brain. I used to keep a really ridiculous, ridiculous, ridiculous Excel <laughs> with all this stuff, and I could not maintain that <laughs> after a couple of years. So now it's more of a more of an informal study um, that's just a continual practice on a daily basis. And then if something pops up, I'm like, ooh, that actually applies to this project over here, or that applies to this you know, idea from a couple of years ago. Um, that's how I use those inputs. The lovely thing about working in a, in a larger corporation is that projects take time, you know, so you, you can continue to impact them, uh, even if they're not no longer in your organiz in your immediate organization or, you know, in your group per se, you can still help drive, you know, success because it lives in the organization for a while before it actually launches. So thank you. And that's a yeah. good example. And I can imagine that having like uh, this steep model, steep, right? That's uh, that's model. Mm -hmm. um, it just gives you a few prompts to think about society, to think about context um, beyond your focus, uh, the focus of the challenge that you're working on currently. Like, <clears throat> what what's the context that I'm operating in? Have you you mentioned that this is at this moment, primarily a mental model. Um, have you have you used tools like this also to bring this into your organization? Uh, because I can imagine that it's great for your identity as a professional that you have this contextual awareness, but it helps if you can get the people around you along on the journey to also see like, hey, listen, this is what's going on. And on top of that, like building this contextual awareness as a group, you can imagine that that's enriching as well. Have you ever done a practice like that? There are a few examples of when I used Steep in, in teams. I think it really depends on the organizational appetite as well for, for ingesting some of this. I think it worked the best when I was at Capital One, um, you know, leading this foresight team. It was called, <laughs> it was called Strategic uh technology emerging technologies for strategic foresight and something like that and we started tracking you know through the steep model we started tracking what was changing um over time you know what we needed to really ingest as we designed services for humans using money so it was a very specific remit right i think that helped us all think better it was a small team it was you know under 10 people so it helped it by keeping it tight and a, and a pretty clear remit for what we were looking for um i would love to continue to bring that back into work that i'm doing now i think it would help look beyond the immediate um again as we've talked about look beyond immediate towards what might be emerging what you know cultural and societal trends might be impacting a larger <laughs> swath of humanity and actually nature too so that's a long way of saying Yes, and I want to do more of it. Well, uh, use this as an excuse to bring it back. You mentioned something, mm -hmm. uh, I think, which uh, maybe um, stepped over too easily, the aspect of timelessness. Um, design is very much driven by time. And uh, how would you... Like, is, is designing for generations a prompt that gets people to think out i don't know outside the box now like in a different way to look at challenges in a different 
way. Like, what's the, what's the? Well, I, I'm struggling today to to formulate mm-hmm. my questions. You're doing a much better job at that. <laughs> but um, what's the role of time? I think time plays such an important role. Um, I think you know the, one of the one of the tools for a strategic foresight is called alternative futures model. And therefore, I'll get to your question about time. Just to use a different example. Um, there are four main archetypes for future potentials, right? So for future scenarios, there's four main archetypes. There's the growth archetype, which is like stuff continues as it is right now. Like everything that we know just continues to grow up. Uh, there's the constraint model. Sometimes it's called discipline, which means like certain elements of our world are rigorously controlled. <laughs> There's a collapse scenario, which is self-descriptive. You know, um, some stuff goes really wrong. We need to figure Armageddon. out how to make it better. Yeah. <laughs> Armageddon. Um, and then there's the transformation archetype, which is actually the most difficult because you have to think about a fundamental paradigm shift. It's not just growth. It's a total paradigm shift of the society that we live in. None of those scenarios can come to life today. You know, it takes time to recognize how you can actually either paradigm shift or collapse or develop a constraint (laughs) governmental situation, for instance. Um, So one of the games I play with, with my team every month uh, is a card game called the thing from the future. And it was originally published. Oh gosh, I think maybe eight years ago um, by a group called the situation lab, Stuart candy. Great, great foresight practitioner um, and human. <laughs> and what it does is actually prompt you with a scenario. So growth, collapse, constraint, um, or transformation. It prompts you with a time. So a century from now, a decade from now, three centuries from now. And it prompts you with a thing to create, given a mood. So you have to create this product in the future on this you know, arc of change, given a time. Um, that helps us get outside of what we think about every day. It helps us think about different ways of engaging um, our creative capacities as we think about how society can change over time. But more than that, I think whenever you do any kind of foresight work, you can just say the future, (laughs) you know, the future is this second. It's also 60 years from now. So getting clear on what time we're thinking about actually helps us create more specificity in what we're designing to say, Hey, we're going to design something for a decade from now. Okay. What does that mean? I'll be X amount of years old. Maybe I'll still be drinking tea in the morning as a habit, but what else is going on? So you can actually ground in a time if you use this idea of of really getting clear about when we're designing for, even if you're wrong about everything that's going on, you know, (laughs) like, um, I think it's a really important grounding device. When you think about designing for longevity, you know, designing for generations, that's a fascinating problem because then you have to think about, does this material break down, for instance? Does it actually give us the same benefit year over year over year? Does it allow us to do something different, you know, 10 years from now than it does right now? How does this thing age? Um, And it really kind of gets us into geologic time again, which I think is important metric as we think about our changing world um you know i was just i just started i just started uh the ministry for the future which is a kim stanley robinson book i just started that last night and the first chapter is about a heat wave in india that gets up to like 140 degrees you know people can't survive on on non-generated AC, right? So people are like pulling out their generators, which are really, really old and clunky, and they're filling them with fuel. And they're trying to figure out how to cool down their apartments. That is a, an old, old, that's an old design. Generators are not new, sexy designs, but it is made to last because of those things, because of the necessity that it has, right? Um, so when we come up with new technological adv- advancements, when we think about new ways that we're engaging in our world, we think about new devices or services, we think about what the most recent cool technology is, but is that the best one for longevity? I don't know. (laughs) That's the question we should ask. So that was a winding answer (laughs) to your question, but I don't know. It it feels like, uh, 
in general, a very explorative uh, conversation here. So um, mm. what I wanted to uh, address is who gives us the um, responsibility or the mandate to think about longevity. The, the way this question came to mind was a lot of us will probably won't be in situations where we're asked to think about beyond the next quarter, beyond the next yearly budget cycle. And at the same time, I was formulating a lot, a lot has gone on in my head throughout this conversation. While I was formulating this question, I thought, well, we shouldn't be waiting or asking for permission to actually incorporate this into our thinking, being, doing. Nobody is going to ask, well, unless you're in a position like you are, uh, most likely this isn't going to be in our job description any day soon. So it's really up to us to bring this into the world today. Does that make sense? Totally agree. I totally agree. Um, and you know, I don't think, I don't think many people are mandated with this. You know, I don't think that's a, a common mandate at all. Um, which makes it kind of fun and subversive. I don't know. I really like subversiveness in some aspects. So if, if you're like me and you like subversiveness, think about timelessness with me. <laughs> you know, um, but I do think. It, it won't be a common request. You know, I think as humans, we tend to be very immediate. Um, and I think it's one of the most important things we can do is think about how what we do today continues to have impact over time. Even if time is a year, if time is a decade, if time is a generation, it's something I think about also, you know, it's, um, you can apply that to real estate and building. You can apply that to like what you put on your body in terms of clothing. You can apply that to, you know, how you, what foods you eat. You can apply that to whatever it is. And you just have to balance your own values, right? So I think when, when I think about the mandate or lack thereof, of thinking about timelessness or timeliness or impact over time, um, it's really a reflection of what you want to prioritize. Mm -hmm. you know and this makes me uh, think about what it means to just be a good practitioner mm -hmm. just like we have to be aware about the ethical implications of the work that we do mm -hmm. we should also be aware of the environmental implications of the work that we put out into the world and um, nobody Again, it's not a mandate. Nobody is going to ask you to do this, but uh, this is just what good work looks like to be a, to incorporate that into what you do on a day to day. Yeah, I can agree more. Yeah, yeah. so um, I, I would say that this is a, a call to action to to all of us to uh, in incorporate more strategic foresight into our practice more thinking games the what was it the thing from the future like was the, that the was that again the thing from the future yeah highly yeah. recommend <laughs> yeah uh so things like this uh definitely help to to raise the the bar for the, the quality uh, of our mm -hmm. work i th i i couldn't find a better word but i think it's just the quality of the work uh, that we do i love that call to action yeah, let's think about the futures together. <laughs> <laughs> if you um, have to leave us uh, with one piece of practical advice and then we'll skip out on the thinking game for now, is there anything, and the, and the steep, you actually have given us a lot of practical advice already. Um, anything else that you can recommend that we do or think about to bring this into our work in our day-to-day -day. you know the one thing we haven't talked about is um that i still find really helpful is just trying to get to a co-creation mode whether you're practicing service design or foresight or design thinking or whatever you're doing um i find co-creation with whatever audience you're targeting just 
unbelievably helpful to ground in real insight from real stakeholders. Admittedly, that's harder with technology and nature than it is with humans. Um, but I do think that there's a prompt for us all to say, okay, how might we co-create better? What would that look like? Um, and what communities or intelligences can we tap into to help us co-create solutions um, that really get at the heart of, of what we're designing for? So a huge believer in co-creation and, and driving collaboration in that way. I think you'll uh, find a lot of uh, bystanders uh, in this in this show who also believe in the power of co-creation. So uh, that's awesome. Um, Ali, uh, one final question. Is if people remember one thing from our conversation today, we've explored a lot. What do you hope it is? You know, we started by talking about mm -hmm. non-anthropocentric design. And um, I think if people take one thing away, it's to think a little bit more weird about the future and about futures in general get a little weird <laughs> challenge your own thinking um in that way you'll be sure to do something different and fun um and really kind of lean into many possible futures that surround us so I, this is my prompt for everyone to get weird <laughs> i think i have a title for the episode so thank you for that um <laughs> Thank you uh, for uh, sharing your uh, thoughts, perspective, wisdom uh, with us today. Uh, it was a blast. It was different than uh, a lot of the other conversations. So uh, thank you. Thank you again. Thank you. Lovely to be here. What a privilege to have experts like Ali join us for a chat who keep inspiring and challenging us. Something that got me really excited is the notion of timeless design. Recently, we had a talk about beauty as the ultimate metric in episode 193 with Alan Moore. And I'm wondering if timelessness also ties into this. Is a beautiful solution one that also stands the test of time? If you have any thoughts about this, make sure to leave a comment down below. If you've enjoyed today's conversation, please do me a quick favor. If you haven't done so already, click that like button on the video to let me know whether or not we're on the right track by addressing topics like this. Finally, before we part ways, please take a moment to reflect and celebrate that by joining us today, you've directed your attention towards learning and growing as a professional. So from everyone who you are going to impact through your work, thank you for taking the time and making the commitment. My name is Mark Fontaine, and I look forward to having you with us for another conversation on the Service Design Show. Take care and see you soon.